Welcome everyone to the OpenSIM webinar. My name is Scott Delp. I'm the professor of bioengineering, mechanical engineering, and orthopedic surgery at Stanford University. And I'm the director of the National Center for Simulation and Rehabilitation Research, which is supporting OpenSIM and sponsoring this webinar. I'm really glad to have so many of you from around the world joining us. I'll be serving as the moderator for the webinar today. And our presenter is Dr. Jen Hicks, who's here with me at Stanford. Before we get started, I want to let you know about OpenSIM. It's a freely available software application for visualizing musculoskeletal structures, simulating movements of humans and animals, and a variety of other applications. It includes tools for performing inverse dynamics, optimizing to estimate muscle and joint forces. It includes methods for creating simulations from motion capture data, and tools for analyzing and visualizing the results of simulations. Our goal in the webinar series is to showcase research that's being performed using OpenSIM. OpenSIM is a growing and geographically diverse community of users, so it's also our goal in this webinar series to provide you with an easy platform to communicate with the OpenSIM community and to collaborate. Just a few reminders about the webinar format. There's a questions that we will address at the end of the presentation. You're welcome to ask those questions during in the Q&A panel. Um, I'll write those down. And, and also, I would uh, encourage you to focus those at the end. It's uh, exciting to see the questions come in from all over the world. If you need additional technical help on the webinar, you can consult the website. And also, technical support for OpenSIM is available on our website. So let me introduce the presentation and our speaker. The question we will address in the webinar is, is my model good enough? And an important topic of verification and validation of musculoskeletal simulations. Dr. Jen Hicks will be the presenter. Jen is the Associate Director of the National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research. She's extremely experienced and skilled with using OpenSIM and is also uh, known to many of you through her uh, tremendous effort to reach out and support OpenSIM research throughout the world. So without further ado, I want to introduce Jen and kick off the formal part of today's webinar. All right. Thanks, Scott. Um, so uh, as Scott mentioned, our, our question for today's webinar is, is my model good enough? So this is one of the most common questions we get from OpenSIM users, and it's also a question that we're constantly asking ourselves. Uh, this question, more formally known as verification and validation, is incredibly important and also incredibly challenging for anyone doing musculoskeletal modeling and simulation. Unfortunately, there's no precise recipe to follow that is one size fits all for every study. But over the next 45 minutes or so, I will introduce you to the key principles that we use here in our lab, and I'll illustrate these principles with several case studies. Validating simulations is really hard. So why even use simulation? Uh, the short answer is because you can have a huge impact. In our group at Stanford, we've been using simulations for over 10 years to help design interventions for individuals with gait pathology as an example. This video shows a child with cerebral palsy and a gait disorder called crouch gait. The, the patient's excessive knee flexion during walking is inefficient, making it hard to keep up with his peers at school or even walk around the house. Uh, so researchers and clinicians have used modeling to uncover the biomechanical reasons that a patient with CP walks with crouch gait. The post-treatment that you're seeing now shows the results of a surgery called a patellar tendon advance and a femoral extension osteotomy. The surgeon, Jim Gage from Gillette Children's Hospital in Minneapolis, repaired the patient's knee joint complex and quadriceps muscles so that the child is able to walk upright. This procedure is based on understanding the mechanics of the system by using models and simulations. Before we dive in, Let's review exactly what we mean by musculoskeletal modeling and simulation. First, it can mean a forward dynamic simulation of movement. So in forward simulation, we start with an estimate of neural command, 
uh, from EMG or controller and integrate forward in time to arrive at an estimated motion. We can include models of muscular tendon dynamics, which take us from EMG or excitation to a muscle force, and a model of musculoskeletal geometry to take us from muscle forces to joint moments. We could also model feedback from sensory organs. A model and simulation framework can be any part or variation of this flowchart. For example, we might ignore feedback, or we could drive our simulation just with joint moments. Modeling and simulation uh, could also mean doing an inverse dynamics analysis. This typically means we start from a measured position uh, and possibly force data and differentiate to determine the dynamics of the system. With a model of musculoskeletal geometry, we can also estimate muscle forces. And again, it can be any part of variation. For example, an inverse kinematics or inverse dynamics analysis both use a model. The next important set of definitions is for verification and validation. Uh, so the definitions you see here are taken from uh, the ASME committee. Uh, so verification is the process of determining that a computational model accurately represents the underlying mathematical model and its solutions. In other words, you're solving the equation right, the equations right. And this can often mean identifying bugs in your code. Then validation is the process of determining the degree, the degree to which a model is an accurate representation of the real world from the perspective of the intended uses of the model. So you're solving the right equations. Uh, and now this typically means comparing to independent experimental data. We'll talk more about both of these uh, as we get further into the talk. Now, there are several reasons uh, why we have to perform verification and validation. First, it's our responsibility as good scientists and researchers. Next, it will help you make an impact with your research by inspiring confidence in your results and conclusions. And third, it helps prevent disasters. Uh, can help you prevent embarrassing yourself and more importantly, uh, preventing hurting others. So there are some famous verification and validation uh, failures out there. Uh, one is the Mars Climate Order Orbiter, which was a probe launched by NASA in 1998 to study the climate conditions on Mars. Uh, they lost communication about a year after the launch of the probe. Now, what happened? Uh, the software that calculated the impulse by the thrusters gave their results in imperial, imperial units, while the software calculating the trajectory of the probe expected an input in SI units. So this was a verification failure. The equations were wrong. Uh, and ultimately, the probe passed through the atmosphere and disintegrated. Verification and validation for biomechanics is also incredibly challenging. It's not linear, and there's no approach that is one size fits all. But we've generated a process and a set of principles in our group, uh, and based on talking to other researchers uh, around the world, and we apply it to any research study. The process begins with formulating the research question, includes the process of prototyping methods, and then the formal verification and validation steps. The process continues even after the study is complete. Documentation, sharing, and generating predictions and hypotheses to test in the real world. So for the remainder of the talk, I'll step through each of these blocks and provide more details plus some examples from our lab. Uh, so now to the first step in the process, defining your research question. In other words, the verification and validation process should begin before you collect data build a model, or run a simulation. So the first question to think about when defining your research question is whether, you should, whether your study could lead to a novel and important contribution. Modeling and simulation, and then verification and validation are incredibly challenging, so the effort and resources, resources exhausted should lead to a significant result. Uh, we can't answer this question exactly. It's certainly uh, very subjective. But there are several considerations to think about. Uh, so first, will your research question improve our fundamental understanding of movement? Will it improve the diagnosis, treatment, or prevention of pathology or an injury? Will it help enhance human mobility or human performance? Or will you create a model, simulation, or tool that others can apply and extend to new research questions? Uh, so that was the first question to think about um, when defining your research study. 
there are two additional questions to consider. First, is your problem well suited to modeling and simulation? In some cases, an experimental study might be more appropriate, or there might already be existing data available to answer your question. Then, uh, you should form your hypotheses and determine if you can actually test them with a model or simulation. Is it something a, mo a model can robustly estimate? estimate? Are there current modeling frameworks you can use, or do you have the skills to build one that can? Uh, so let's illustrate the process of defining a research question with a few examples. Uh, and make, make sure you pay attention here, because uh, we'll have a quiz or an opportunity for, for you guys to try to uh, answer the questions uh, coming up later. Uh, so the first example, uh, so children with cerebral palsy often walk with excessive knee flexion called a crouch gait, as we saw in the video at the beginning of the talk. So hamstring lengthening surgery is often prescribed to relieve tightness or spasticity uh, in the hamstrings muscle group and thus improve knee kinematics during walking. So consider the research question, uh, what gait kinematics will a patient adopt after a hamstring surgery? So what knee flexion angles, what hip flexion angle, et cetera. So is this a well-defined research question for modeling and simulation? Uh, I'll, walk, I'll walk you through this example and then uh, you'll get to try a few yourselves. Uh, so the possible answers include uh, yes, this question needs modeling and or simulation, and it's also testable. B, no, this question doesn't need modeling or simulation. Or C, this question is impossible or very challenging to test uh, with a model or simulation, and thus it's probably not well suited uh, to uh, being a modeling simulation study. So for this question, uh, predicting the gait kinematics after a surgery, I would say um, this is probably a no, at least at this point. Um, we can't do this reliably yet. Predicting how the motor control system will adapt to surgery is incredibly challenging. We can try to predict trends, predict good candidates for surgery. We can try to identify risk factors for good and poor outcomes. But predicting um, the specific kinematics with which an individual patient will walk after surgery uh, is, is not possible yet, or at least it's very, very challenging with the current simulation tools available. But this is a grand challenge for the field. Uh, I think this is something we all want to get to. All right, but let's try a different formulation of the question and see what you guys think about this one. Um, so say we have a big set of patient data with pre- and post-operative gait analysis data. And the question is, does hamstring surgery improve crouch gait in children with cerebral palsy? Uh, say we define improvement in crouch gait um, as the change in knee flexion angle during the stance phase of walking. All right, so now I'll give you guys an opportunity to uh, write down what you think. Uh, so again, we have the same choices. We'll give everyone a few moments uh, to write down your answers. Uh, the option is A, yes, the question needs modeling and or simulation and is testable. B, no, it doesn't need modeling and or simulation. Or C, no, the question is impossible or very challenging to test with a model or simulation. All right. So hopefully everyone has written down their answer. Um, and I will bring up what we picked as, as the solution for this one. Uh, and I'll say A, yes, this question needs modeling and or simulation, and it's also testable. Uh, some of you might have put B, that it doesn't need modeling and or simulation, since you're just looking at joint angles. Uh, but uh, this is a little bit of a trick question. You do need a model to get joint angles. Then you can use statistical analysis to look for significant improvement after surgery, for example. All right, so hopefully everyone uh, is getting the hang of this because we have another example. Um, so the force a muscle can generate depends not only on its cross-sectional area, but also its length, velocity, and the interaction between the muscle and tendon. So now consider the research question uh, shown here. Does switching from walking to running put muscles in a better state to generate force? Uh, so the things we have available are a musculoskeletal model and a forward simulation framework plus experimental motion data for walking and running at a range of speeds. All right, so what do you guys think? Uh, we have the same choices. A, uh, yes, this question needs modeling and or simulation, and we can also test it. 
B, no, this question doesn't need modeling and or simulation. Or C, no, this question is impossible to test with a model or simulation. All right, so go ahead and, and write down your answers. Okay, so here, here's the, the answer we selected for this one. Uh, a, uh, another yes. Um, so experiments can give you uh, some information about absolute lengths and velocities of muscle fascicles during motion, but this can't give you the normalized lengths and velocities that define the force generating capacity of muscles. But we can use a model and simulation framework to test this hypothesis, and we'll see more details in the next section of the talk. All right, so now uh, hopefully we've formulated a research question that's well suited to modeling and simulation. Uh, so the next step is to develop your simulation framework and really understand and evaluate it. So carefully developing your methods is a vital process, part of the process with many steps. Uh, so several questions to consider. First, do you understand how your modeling and simulation framework works? Uh, you can't treat a model or simulation or a software tool as a black box. You have to know the limitations, the key sensitivities, what data you'll need to validate, what input data you'll use to calibrate your model uh, before you can start a study or understand how to perform the V&V process. Next, does your research question lie within the scope of intended uses of the simulation framework you've selected? So what was the model designed to be used for? Uh, is it a lower, a lower extremity model, an upper extremity model? Is it meant um, for doing a kinematics or dynamics analysis to study walking or sprinting? Third, uh, have you eliminated unnecessary mo model complexity? So a more complex model is not necessarily a more accurate model. Too much complexity leads to a larger validation burden. And fourth, um, what assumptions are you making? And how might these assumptions affect your research question? For example, a static optimization analysis typically ignores tendon compliance, so it's not a good fit to answer questions about elastic energy storage in, in, in tendons during a motion. Um, so now we'll step through the process of answering these questions with a case study. So let's use the example that I introduced earlier. So this is work by Edith Arnold, a former graduate student in the NIMBLE lab here at Stanford. Uh, and a reminder of her question, does switching from walking uh, to running put muscles in a better state to generate force? For example, do muscles like the plantar flexors operate at lower speeds if you switch from a fast walk to a slow run and thus become better at generating force? So the inputs to the simulation are electromyographic or EMG data and joint angles from a motion capture experiment. We do some modeling and simulation. And then the outputs are the estimates of muscle length and velocity. But what's going on behind these cool movies? This slide shows Edith's simulation framework. Again, the inputs are the experimental data. We use activation dynamics modeling to go from measured EMG to activation, then contraction dynamics. This takes activation plus muscle tendon states from the musculoskeletal model and uses these inputs to calculate muscle forces along with lengths and velocities, which is Edith's output of interest. Uh, so Edith's question is how walking and running impact force generating capacity. So understanding how this contraction dynamics piece works is key. So let's review the model of muscle contraction dynamics that Edith used and that's included in OpenSim. Uh, so force generation depends on several factors. The passive force strain properties of tendon plus the force length and force velocity property of muscle. Uh, this is represented in the three normalized curves across the top of the slide. Then to calculate muscle and tendon forces, we use a hill type muscle model. So the force in the tendon, that's uh, the equation on the left, is determined by where you are in the force strain curve, so that's the FT, scaled by the max muscle force of the muscle of interest. Then on the right side, uh, the force in the muscle is determined by activation plus where you are in the force length and force velocity curves, again scaled by the max um, 
the max muscle force of the muscle of interest. So why did Edith need to understand the muscle models? Uh, there are several reasons. First, um, it helps us understand that many factors affect force generation in a muscle, not just strength and not just activation, and this supports our need to use a model. Also, how we choose the curves could change our answers, and this will be important when we discuss sensitivity testing later in the talk. Uh, in addition, we have to account for the inter interaction of the muscle and the tendon, uh, and we can't just look at one in isolation. Uh, we'll have to equilibrate, and we should also we should um, we'll have to equilibrate in the code uh, that defines our muscle model, and this is definitely something we should verify that we're doing correctly. We also have to understand our input data. So one of Edith's key inputs was EMG from several lower extremity muscles. EMG was measured with surface sensors and filtered using standard protocols documented in the literature. She then normalized to the maximum value recorded over all walking and running speeds. The figure on the right shows an example of a processed EMG signal from the soleus uh, during running. So the processed signal is in red. Uh, so could we just plug this into our contraction dynamics model to get forces, lengths, and velocities for the muscles of interest? The short answer is no. Uh, we want to take this EMG signal and transform it into a muscle activation. Uh, so at first, we just fed the process EMG directly into the contraction dynamics model. Uh, this gave the wrong answers. Um, to get answers that were a good match with experimental data, you just had to account for several things. Uh, first, there was an elect the electromechanical delay. So there's a well-documented delay between measuring EMG and generating forces and moments. Uh, it takes time to propagate action potential in the muscle and begin binding of actin and myosin. Uh, and this equals a delay between measured electrical signal and activation or force. Uh, we also have to uh, have activation dynamics, which acts as a filter, going from the square waves we see with excitation uh, to ramped activation and forces. Uh, so for this study, it was essential for Edith to understand her simulation framework and also understand the data going into the system to get good results. Choosing and understanding your model is also essential. Uh, so in Edith's study, the model she used is one that she developed herself in earlier work. Uh, it's based on a comprehensive and cohesive set of muscle architecture data from a large set of cadavers. This makes it a great choice for studying lower limb musculotendon dynamics. For example, when uh, building the model, she carefully compared measured to experimental moment arms and moments about each joint. So as an example, we have the ankle moment. Uh, in the figure on the slide. There are also some important limitations of the model. Uh, first, the Fmax taken from the PCSA measure, measurements was in cadavers um, who were mostly elderly, uh, so this um, required some scaling of the mass, max isometric force in her model uh, to match the moments produced by young, healthy individuals. Uh, so for Edith's study, let's go back to the original question uh, to summarize our, our review here. So her, former, her framework used a model suitable for walking and running motion that accounts for full muscle tendon dynamics. So it was able to answer our re research question. And here are some of the results she found. Uh, the plots show the force velocity curves with data points for walking and running. Um, the points show the peak normalized velocities for the soleus and gastroc measured during uh, each motion. And what we see is that in these two muscles, changing from walking to running, uh, so going from the small um, circle to the large circle, reduced the fiber velocity of these muscles so that they could generate more of their maximum force. This means that even though our subjects sped up their movements when they switched from walking to running, their plantar flexor fibers slowed down, enabling them to produce more force. So that was a question that Edith was able to answer with her framework. There are other questions uh, that this framework wouldn't be able to answer. For example, do different muscle fibers within a muscle operate at different lengths during the motion? Uh, the model assumed all fibers were at the same length or velocity, so you would need a different framework um, to answer this type of question. 
Or uh, another question might be, does wearing an exoskeleton affect muscle operating regions and force generating ability? Again, you need experimental data or an exoskeleton model uh, to answer this question. We actually, um, there are some researchers, Dominic Ferris, um, who presented a webinar a few months ago uh, where you could learn more about this question. All right, so that was a review of prototyping your methods. Uh, the next step is verification. So this is often the job of the person who develops the code, whether it's in C++, MATLAB, Python, or any other language. But if you're just a user of the code, you still have to understand how the code is being verified, and you may need to create new verification tests if you're new using the software in a new way. The foundation of verification includes the following components. Uh, first, writing test cases. You have to write test cases when you develop a new piece of code. You're essentially trying to figure out all the ways you could break it. Uh, then you have to rerun your test cases whenever you change the software. Uh, next, uh, comparing to benchmarks. So these are problems with known solutions. Uh, for example, you could verify uh, dynamics code by uh, simulating the dynamics of a double pendulum uh, and comparing to the known solution. Uh, you can also compare against other similar software packages. Uh, and then third, you have to check for physical principles uh, like conservation of energy. So here's one of our verification tests for the muscle models in OpenSim. The motion is simple. Uh, we activate the muscle and force the ball to move in a sinusoidal pattern. Then we can perform several checks. First, is the muscle self consistent? OpenSim calculates the force and velocity, and thus the power of the active part of the muscle fiber. It also calculates the passive fiber power and tendon power. Verification checks, uh, a verification te test checks that the sum of the parts equals the total uh, muscle actuator power. So the red and the blue uh, curves are uh, overlaid. The next test, are we conserving energy throughout the motion? We can calculate uh, the kinetic energy due to the movement of the block, uh, plus the potential energy stored in the passive structures in the model, minus any work done by the active part of the muscle, and the sum should be constant throughout the simulation. So these are just a couple quick examples of verification. There are many more verification tests we perform for muscles and the other computational components of OpenSim. All right, so now we're at the point where you generate your initial simulation results. And surprise, it, it often doesn't work the first time. This is where the iteration comes in to make sure you understand your methods, fix bugs, uh, verify again, maybe collect some more experimental data, uh, and repeat the process until you have a simulation that at least looks like you would expect. Uh, so this is a running simulation generated by Sam Hamner, a former grad student in our group. Uh, now that simulation looked good, uh, but that's just a start. Now the formal process of validation can begin. So what does validation mean? It means comparing to independent data sets. Uh, this can include marker data, ground reaction forces, and EMG data from a motion capture experiment. Uh, it could be imaging or cadaver studies, which uh, might give you information about skeletal or, mu or muscle architecture. Uh, it could be ultrasound data uh, to give you muscle fascicle dynamics, for example or uh, you could compare to joint loads from instrumented joint replacements if you're trying to predict joint reaction forces. Uh, you can also compare against other uh, independent models and simulations. So a really important point here is that validation is distinct from model calibration. If you've you already used the data to tune your model or simulation, that's calibration, you can also use it to validate your results. Let's dive into a little more detail with another example. Uh, so our potential research question is the following. Uh, we have a modeling and simulation plus experimental mocap data for a group of subjects during running. Uh, and the question is, which muscles break, propel, and support the body during running? Um, now, before we get started, we, we have to go back and make sure this is a well-defined research question. Uh, so go ahead and, and write down what you guys think for this one. Uh, a, so again, a reminder of the possible answers. A, yes, this question needs modeling or simulation and it's testable. B, no, uh, this question doesn't need modeling and or simulation. Or C, no, because this question is uh, impossible or very challenging to test. All right, I'll give you a, a minute to um, write down what you think your answer is. 
And uh, luckily this one is yes, because it's going to be our example. Um, so this is a study performed by Sam Hamner, uh, another former grad student from our group. He collected experimental data for running and created the first 3D muscle-driven uh, simulation of running uh, using the computed muscle control tool in OpenSim to calculate muscle forces. And he used the simulation to understand how the muscles in the lower extremity contribute to supporting the body plus braking and propelling it forward. So Sam used an extensive calibration and validation process to generate each simulation. Uh, I'll just show a couple examples from his uh, extensive process here. Uh, so one example of validation, he compared experimental EMG shown in gray uh, to activations calculated by OpenSim CMC tool. Uh, so for the muscles shown, we generally get a good match for on and offset time, which is what uh, Sam was looking for. We also see a delay uh, between the simulated activation and experimental EMG, which is expected given our earlier discussion of activa activation dynamics uh, in Edith's study. Uh, now, this isn't the type of match that we would expect, say, comparing joint angles or moments between um, the simulation and the experimental data, uh, but we see that we're capturing the key characteristics of the motion and how it's coordinated. After generating the simulations and gaining confidence in the predicted activations and forces, Sam performed what's called an induced acceleration analysis to determine the contribution of each muscle to the acceleration of the center of mass. Uh, so a muscle, say the soleus, generates a force. This creates a reaction force between the foot and the ground, which accelerates the center of mass. Uh, then the mass uh, of the model times the acceleration of the center of mass due to the soleus muscle is what we call its contribution. So forward uh, is braking or propulsion, and upward is support. Uh, so the graph shows the result for the soleus, uh, and we see that the muscle is supporting the body and propelling it forward during this stance phase of running. So Sam did this for each model, uh, and when you sum up all the F values from each mo of each muscle, you should get the total acceleration of the center of mass or the ground reaction force, and Sam did indeed find this. Uh, so these were just two quick examples of the calibration and validation that Sam performed. Uh, Sam also did extensive analysis of the kinematics, kinetics, uh, the reserve and residual forces for each of his simulations, for example. And you can see more details uh, in his paper. Uh, and he also provides all of the um, simulation data and setup files so you could actually uh, regenerate the simulations and go through the process yourself as well. Uh, so Sam also found something interesting. Um, looking at uh, support and propulsion, when he took the quadriceps muscles plus the ankle plantar flexors, this actually accounted for the majority of the ground reaction force. Uh, so these muscles are the major supporters, uh, the major contributors to support and propulsion during running. All right, um, so that was a very quick run through of uh, what validation means. Uh, the next step, you must test the robustness of your results to uncertainty and variability in your model and input data. Uh, so there are several key questions when testing sensitivity. Uh, first, what inputs have the highest variability or uncertainty? Next, uh, what inputs uh, will potentially have the biggest effect on your research question or outputs of interest? And third, uh, will input data or modeling uncertainty change the answer to your research question, which is really uh, the key question. So we'll go back to Edith's example to illustrate one type of uh, sensitivity testing. So um, Edith was using experimental uh, data to drive her simulations, uh, so the EMG and, and the kinematics, uh, but she left out one piece uh, for validation, the ground reaction forces. Uh, so in her simulation, she calculated muscle forces, so she can also calculate uh, the net joint moment generated by those muscles. Uh, she also measured the ground reaction force during experiments, so she has the net moments at the joints uh, through inverse dynamics. Uh, so she compared a simulation to these values. Uh, and then the same thing for joint powers, uh, which are the net moment times the angular velocity at the joint. Now, when Edith first compared the simulated moments and powers to her inverse dynamics results, her simulations could not match the inverse dynamics. They produced too much negative power and not enough positive power. Uh, so Edith did a sensitivity analysis to determine the effect of tendon compliance 
uh, on her calculated ankle moments uh, since she knew that um, tendon compliance was one of the uh, biggest um, potential uh, contributors to variable variability in her results. Uh, so this plot shows the results of the analysis. Uh, so each curve shows the ankle power over time. Uh, the cooler colors, so the um, blues and purples, um, show increasing tendon compliance. Uh, and the black curve is the value from inverse dynamics. Uh, she found that originally the Achilles tendon was too stiff, uh, so that's the red curve. With stiff tendons, the fibers get dragged around with the motion of the joints, and little energy can be stored in the tendon. But increasing tendon compliance shifted the timing of the moment, and since the velocities were fixed uh, from her kinematic data, uh, it moved the power from negative to positive. Uh, so Edith ultimately used a value of 10%, which gave her a good match to her experimental data, and is supported by ultrasound measures in the literature. Uh, she also determined that this, in spite of changing tendon compliance, she still got the same answer to her research question. Uh, so we'll re uh, this figure shows one more cool summary of her results. Uh, so she found that speed affects the force generating capacity for plantar flexors and other muscles as well. Uh, for example, with the, the gas rock, force generating, generating ability uh, decreases um, as you walk faster then increases with the transition to a run. Uh, but in contrast, uh, the vast eye show an increase in force generation capacity as you walk faster. Uh, so these muscles are better to recruit at faster walking speeds. Uh, so she found that the plantar flexors were more sensitive to tendon compliance than the vast, than the vast eye. Uh, but luckily for both muscles, these trends uh, shown on the slide here were the same even when she made the tendons stiffer or more compliant. All right, so the next key principle to discuss is making predictions and hypotheses that you can test in the real world. So can you generate hypotheses that we wouldn't have been able to come up with just by observing or experimenting? Or can you predict de novo phenomena we observe in the real world? Uh, this is important for validation and a big opportunity for our field. This is how we can really make an impact and convince the skeptics. Uh, sometimes it can take a while, decades maybe, uh, but this is how we change the field um, and change rehab outcomes, for example. Uh, so one area where we're trying to do this in our group is predicting outcomes in patients with cerebral palsy. So we've used modeling and simulation to identify variables that we can plug in statist into statistics models that can predict good and poor candidates for surgery. Uh, we're not predicting gait, but giving a likelihood of positive outcomes, so that's improved crouch gate, uh, the solid green circles, versus poor outcomes, uh, so no change or worse in crouch gate after extensive uh, surgery, those are the red solid circles. Uh, with further testing and validation against more clinical data, uh, we hope to help this be employed in the, uh, to help in the clinic to help decision making. Uh, we're also working on developing neural controllers that can synthesized by mechanically accurate motions under a variety of conditions. So this is work by Tim Dorn and Jack Wong, former, former postdocs from our group. Uh, so here we're not tracking any existing experimental data. We're representing the musculoskeletal system plus a control structure and then opti optimizing for parameters uh, in that control structure that give us a stable gait uh, with minimal energetic cost. Uh, and so we repeated this uh, under many conditions. So here we see uh, walking with uh, loads at a variety of percent body weight. Um, and we see how that impacts metabolic cost. Uh, and we also repeated the experiments for walking up a variety of inclines. Uh, so this type of work, um, we're predicting new motions. Uh, opens up the possibility for making new predictions. For example, how someone will respond to a device. Uh, and then we can test these predictions uh, with an experiment. Okay, so the final step uh, is documenting and sharing uh, your methods and your results. Uh, there are several reasons that this step is important. Uh, first, it allows others to help you verify your code uh, if you share your code so others can uh, view and use it. Uh, it also allows others to validate your model or simulation framework for new uses. 
if you carefully document your verification and validation process, this also helps teach other researchers uh, what the VNV process looks like. Uh, and then as a field, we don't have to reinvent the wheel and the whole VNV process with each new study. Uh, new researchers can focus their verification and validation on the new uses or changes to a model. Uh, so one very important caveat to that last point, uh, just because you've downloaded a model doesn't mean it's been validated for the ways you plan to use it. So SimTK.org uh, is one platform for sharing models, data, and simulations and tools. Uh, so we encourage you all to uh, create projects on SimTK.org. Uh, to, for example, accompany a new paper. Uh, in addition to allowing um, to share your models and your tools for others to download, it also has user forums and places to post documentation to encourage training and documentation. So here I've just picked a couple example projects. Uh, we have a primate model from Brian Umberger's group, an upper extremity model from Ed Chadwick's group, and also the page for the grand challenge to predict in vivo, in vivo knee loads from BJ Fregley and others. Uh, this is a great example of a benchmark problem. Uh, so for this project, competitors are asked to predict joint loads, uh, and the instrumented knee replacement uh, data is held back and provides a truly independent validation set. So this has been uh, an overview of the verification and validation process. We've really only scratched the surface. Uh, so in closing, I want to point you to resources where you can learn more. Uh, so our group recently published a paper on the topic. Uh, this paper contains many more details and examples. Uh, so what's in the paper? Um, so we've included a detailed review of verification and validation best practices for each potential component of the simulation, along with many more case studies. Um, we also summarize uh, the best practices in several tables. Uh, so the tables uh, at the end of the paper summarize the tests you should perform when building a model, when running a forward simulation, or when performing an inverse uh, analysis. Um, plus, the quality of a model or simulation really depends on the inputs. Uh, so the table lists all of these dependencies uh, which each must be verified and validated. Uh, and then for each test, we also provide a best practice with guidelines for how close the match or comparison should be. Uh, so here's one little snippet from one of the tables. Uh, so one example, if you're using muscle activation as an output of a forward simulation, uh, the value of activations you get depends on the controller model or the input controls you use, uh, plus the activation dynamics model you're using. Uh, and then the validation best practices include comparing on and offset timings with EMG and ensuring that activation and EMG curves are qualitatively similar. Uh, we also provide additional resources in the OpenSIM documentations, documentation. So for example, we have a library of models, uh, which is a wiki style table that combines um, information for models developed by our group and many other researchers. And one of the columns in the table describes intended uses and known limitations. Uh, so she, you should review this along with any additional documentation and papers when using someone else's models. Uh, and also, if you develop a model, you should make sure the intended uses and limitations are clearly documented for others. Uh, we also have a page that describes best practices uh, tailored to uh, the tools provided with OpenSIM. And then we have other uh, sections in the documentation, uh, like a theory guide and chapters in the user's guide for OpenSIM that describe how each tool works. Uh, so we'll follow up the webinar with links to each of these uh, resources so you can um, find them and learn more and use them in your own research studies. Um, now, in closing, there are also several challenges that we need to tackle as a field uh, to help make validation easier and more effective. Uh, so this is our challenge uh, to you guys. Um, first, uh, we need gold standards like that grand challenge data set that I showed a couple slides ago. So these are standard problems that uh, new models and frameworks should be able to solve quickly and robustly. Next, uh, we believe that transparency is essential. Uh, we need to share models and simulations so that others can reproduce uh, and verify and validate uh, in new ways. 
Uh, so we post and share models and simulations from our studies, as well as the OpenSim uh, source code as well. Uh, and we encourage you, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to share your results and uh, data and models from your studies on simtk.org or other platforms. Uh, we also need automated tools to help with the verification and validation process. So if you could easily set up and run a sensitivity analysis, many more people would do it. Um, so we have some researchers who are starting to do this. For example, Brad Davidson recently presented uh, a webinar on this top on the topic of sensitivity testing. Uh, we also have to continue to learn and teach others. Uh, so models and simulations shouldn't be a black box. Uh, that's hopefully why you guys are tuning into the webinar series. Uh, and then finally, we need more excellent research. Uh, so think about this as you work on your research studies and formulate new questions. Uh, how will you have an impact? Uh, this is one of the best ways to validate by having an impact in the real world. All right, so before we get to the Q&A session, I just want to uh, uh, first thank all of the co-authors on the paper. That's Tommy Cheetah, Scott Delp, AJ Seth, and Apoorva Rajagopal. Uh, and then in the second row uh, is uh, thank you to all of the people who helped uh, with the paper and providing the example uh, I used, the examples I used in the webinar, uh, along with our funding sources. So with that, uh, we can switch over to questions. Great, Jen. Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, for there, it's nice to see there are about 80 people tuned into the webinar. And a couple of you are beginning to ask questions already, and I encourage others to go ahead and ask questions as well. I'll get started with a question that was asked by Dario um, already, and I think I'll give Jen a break, and I'll ask and answer the question while she uh, settles, settles in here. So Dario asks, what is the best approach to verify that a constraint is not generating an undesired force. And what Dario means there, it's an advanced question. You can, in your model, include kinematic constraints. That is, a, a constraint that requires a joint to move in a particular way, for example. And those constraints can induce forces, and those forces may produce motions. So to answer Dario's question, you can ask the constraint to report its force. So any constraint can determine what the force is, and you can uh, put that out as a, a report, as an analysis of the constraint. So you should always do that. And if you know the constraint force, you can see what motions that force is inducing and see if it's inducing forces that you didn't intend it to induce. There's some technical details about go, how to go about doing that. And Dario, if you have those questions, I encourage you to ask them on the forum so that we can give you specific pointers to the documentation. Great. So uh, second question, Cohen asks uh, the following question. You presented a, an analysis using induced accelerations to assess what muscles are doing. There was a, a critical review by Andy Ruina at the World Congress of Biomechanics of the induced acceleration approach, suggesting that it's not valid. Are you, the question is, are you sure that uh, you're getting valid result, results from an induced acceleration analysis? And I'll, I'll answer this one as well. Um, uh, Professor Ruina correctly points out that when you develop a model, the analysis of that model will vary depending on if you change the model. For example, if you lock a joint, you'll get a different answer than if you have a free joint. So if you, if you have a model with an ankle and you do an induced acceleration analysis, and then you change the model so that it doesn't have an angle, an ankle, for example, you get a different answer. And he suggests that that invalidates the approach of using induced accelerations. I would take a broader view and say it's important to recognize that the form your model takes is going to influence your interpretation of the model. But the induced acceleration analysis is mathematically valid. And if you would test your analysis properly, for example, showing that the accelerations induced by the sum of all muscles equals the measured net acceleration, that you can gain great insights into 
your um, simulation using an induced acceleration analysis. I guess one follow-up to that question, too, is that um, it also brings up some other interesting ways you could validate that approach. So there are researchers who have used functional electrical stimulation to increase the um, activity of muscles during walking to try to replicate experimentally what you're doing with an induced acceleration analysis. Uh, so hopefully you're able to replicate the same conclusions about you know, which muscles are supporting and propelling uh, by analyzing those experimental results. Uh, and then with new forward simulation paradigms as well, you could, for example, uh, increase or decrease the strength of muscles to see whether or not um, that has this, get, leads to the same conclusions as well. It's a, it's a great response because it gets back to comparing your analysis to experimental results. I would also just say in response that induced acceleration is one approach to analyzing a model. There are others that are frequently used, and, and uh, those, it's, I think, best to come at the question from a variety of points of view and not rely on a, a single point of view. And we find that when, when we analyze a system from multiple points of view and all these points of view are leading to the same answer about the dynamics, that we have greater confidence in the answers. And that's usually what we require before we publish our results. Okay, Jen, I have another question coming in from, from Cohen, who says, okay, the title of your talk is, Is My Model Good Enough? And uh, we appreciate that we're comparing the simulation results to experimental data. But how do you know when that comparison is good enough? Do you have guidelines for that? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, and it, it really, you know, ultimately it depends on what your research question is, how you're going to use your model in simulation. Um, but that's kind of a, a cop-out answer. Uh, so what we've done in the paper is try to summarize for, you know, the most typical uses of a model in simulation, how, how close a match should you get. Um, so if you look at the tables in the paper, we talked about you know, how close a match you should expect for kinematic data versus EMG uh, versus, for example, how small should your uh, residual and reserve forces uh, be uh, for, for um, a simulation. So, for example, if you're looking at the joint moments generated by muscles versus reserve actuators uh, in the open sim terminology, uh, those reserve actuators should really only be generating a, a small percent of the net joint moment uh, and a, a percent that's not making a, a, contribu a, a significant contribution to the research question you're trying to answer. Great. Thank you. Okay, another question coming in, and it's, again, about uh, testing with respect to experimental data. And it brings up the good point that sometimes in vivo data is not available because it's simply too difficult to collect. The question is, what about comparing to in vitro data? And it's a great question because a lot of times we are simulating because we simply can't measure that variable. And in vitro comparisons can be really valuable in that instance. For example, when we look at a muscle model and we want to see if it can generate forces that are consistent with what real muscles do, there are um, in vitro comparisons of that uh, of muscle force generation with a variety of activations and lengths and velocities, and making those comparisons uh, is quite valuable for testing the model. So in many instances, the in vitro data uh, can provide good insight. For example, if you have cadaver studies and you're measuring moment arms in a cadaver, you might compare that to your model. And that's an excellent uh, verification and validation step to take. Okay, um, Muthu is asking a question, what's the best approach to validate, to validate a new prosthesis design in OpenSIM? Three-dimensional gait analysis um, with existing prostheses would be available. I'd like to use OpenSIM for simulation prior to fabrication of a new prosthesis. You want to take that, Jen, or do you want me to try it? Um, sure. Okay, so it's, uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at here, but let's say that um, you're trying to assess the, uh, the 
an external prosthesis, like a limb prosthesis, a foot prosthesis, versus a, an implant, a hip or knee prosthesis. And we uh, use simulations to test new designs of prosthetic devices by, for example, we make a, a simulation of walking, and then you can vary the parameters of a prosthetic design by changing its stiffness, for example, and seeing what uh, new gait and new muscle activations that might generate. It's not specifically a verification validation, but we can do those studies quite quickly to see what changes in muscle activation might be. And then post hoc, after we've done the simulation, we'll go in and do the experiment and to see if we predict changes in muscle activations, for example, that are consistent with what we would expect from uh, what we can measure in an experiment. So we use it as an iterative loop. We'll do design of a prosthetic device in OpenSim, and then we'll generate experimental hypotheses that we go into the laboratory and test. There's other approaches you could take depending on the experimental design is, you know, if you can instrument the prosthetic as well uh, to get, for example, reaction forces between the residual limb and the prosthetic, um, you should be able to simulate those uh, and compare to the experimentally measured values. Here's another interesting question. When performing sensitivity analyses, the model is highly nonlinear. Oops, it just went off my screen. Highly model highly nonlinear, and there are coupling factors. Do you think it's feasible to design a general sensitivity analysis? So, um, sensitivity analysis is not my particular area of expertise as far as the de design of sensitivity analysis approaches. Uh, but there are a couple nice papers that have come out um, from Brad, Brad Davison's group and others uh, discussing how you handle these issues. So there's uh, Monte Carlo testing where you uh, sample the, the various uh, um, variables that are known to have um, variability or uncertainty uh, and can do that uh, type of stochastic approach uh, is, is one way to handle coupling. The other, the other way we do sensitivity analyses is that we do the analysis with respect to the scientific question we're intending to answer. So if we have some fundamental conclusion that we're trying to draw from a simulation, maybe in combination with experiments, we'll see whether the answer to that question is sensitive to variables for which there is uncertainty with, uh, for which there's uncertainty. And if the answer is very sensitive to variables for which we have high uncertainty, then we, we don't have confidence in the answer, and we usually won't publish the paper. On the other hand, if the, the answer to the question is not sensitive to parameters for which there's uncertainty, we still get the same fundamental conclusion, then we go ahead and have confidence in that result, and, and we'll publish a paper uh, along with the sensitivity analysis. So that's not a, a standard analysis. That's a sensitivity analysis that's done for each particular study, and I think Jen's suggestion of these standard methods, together with image sensitivity analyses that are done for a particular study, is the best approach. Okay, there's another question coming in. How would you go about verifying the model against impact forces or impulse during running or even walking? So, do you understand the question? Um, I'm not sure. I guess if you want to start in a, I mean, it depends on what experimental data you're measuring. Um, so, the impulse you calculate from your model will depend on the kinematics and the external forces that you measure. Um, so, comparing, uh, making sure you have good data for those, and then, um, so in the paper, we talk about uh, dynamic consistency between the kinematics and ground reaction forces. Uh, so if you, in OpenSim, if you look at your residuals, those should, those should be small, indicating that uh, your model experimental data uh, and experimental data are, are uh, representing the system well. Um, and then you, know, you might also consider um, using other measurement techniques that might be uh, better able to, like a, an INU um, might help in this case as well. Good, let me take a crack at it and then we'll uh, close the webinar. 
in some simulations, we actually apply the ground reaction force that we've measured. And in those cases, we, we can't use it uh, for, a, for independent verification and validation in inverse dynamics, for example. But in other cases, we do simulations where we compute the reaction force or the reaction impulse with a contact model. And in that case, we have independent experimental data that we could use to compare with our simulation. And that's a very nice test to do. And one for which you, you need to get the contact forces to be very accurate to get the dynamics right. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed the webinar. And I want to thank Jen for doing a great job putting the slides together and presenting it. Uh, if there are other questions, please feel to ask them online and we'll respond online. And uh, thanks again for participating in the webinar and for your ongoing support and interest in OpenSIM. Take care and have a, have a great uh, research adventure. <laughs>